Recently, I saw a TikTok praising Civilization VI and Crusader Kings III for how it included and embraced Black African history. This game and the new Crusader Kings are the only games that highlights the existence of Black civilization before slavery. And whilst I do believe that both of these games are progressive in their depiction of history, in Civ VI there is an aspect of a specific African civilization that doesn't make any sense. Why is it that the Congo can't found its own religion? Of course, it makes for very interesting gameplay, and Mavemba Anazinga, Congo's leader in Civ VI, was famously a religious convert, hence the leader ability of the same name. Nevertheless, this mechanic neglects the rich religious history of the Congolese, so in this video we want to give it a bit of context on the topic of Congolese culture and religion, explaining Sid Meier's take on Congo and its real life basis. Before we begin, I should mention that we made this video before the new leader pass had been announced, which includes a new leader for the Congo, Queen Nzinga Mbande. If you play as her, the Congo does have the ability to form a religion. We think this is a great improvement in terms of reflecting the culture of the Congolese, however any criticism regarding religious conversion within Mvemba's Congo still stands. As we will discuss later on, the conversion of its leader to Catholicism did not lead to a widespread conversion of the Congolese people that replaced their rich and diverse pantheons and faiths. Moreover, where Catholicism was adopted, it was drastically altered to suit the various regional cultures and traditions that were already in place. But more on that later. And as always, please excuse any horrendous pronunciations on my part. The story of the Kingdom of Congo is one of military prowess, unification, centralization, prosperity, and then, yeah, the Europeans come along and screw it all up. The chap you can play in Civ 6, Mavemba Anazinga, or Afonso I of Congo as he was called upon his conversion, ruled the Kingdom of Congo at the end of its peak, from 1509 to 1543. Having been educated by Portuguese missionaries for 10 years prior to his reign, he was Catholic and fluent in Portuguese by the time he took the throne. His letters are actually the earliest preserved correspondence by an African ruler in a European language. The Portuguese had arrived in the kingdom during the reign of his father, Nzinga Anakuwu. Trade relations had developed, and Portugal sent Catholic missionaries who were initially welcomed to the kingdom. Even Movember's father became Catholic. However, when it did become clear to him that a good Catholic has to live, oh, monogamously, he did a classic Henry VIII and abandoned his new faith. Movember, however, remained a staunch Catholic. He became ruler after winning a decisive battle against his half-brother and rival, Mpanzu Anazinga, ascribing his victory over Mpanzu to his new Christian god. Movember's reign was characterised on the one hand by a centralised, strong state, and on the other by his attempts to reconcile Portugal's pressing demand for Central African slaves and his own Catholic faith. He wrote numerous letters during his reign to both the Portuguese king and the Vatican, complaining about the behaviour of the Portuguese slave traders in the Congo. One of his letters reads as follows. Each day, the traders are kidnapping our people. Children of this country, sons of our nobles and vassals. This corruption and depravity are so widespread that our land is entirely depopulated. We need in this kingdom only priests and school teachers, and no merchandise, unless it is wine and flour for mass. It is our wish that this kingdom not be a place for trade or transport of slaves. Many of our subjects eagerly lust after Portuguese merchandise that your subjects have brought into our domains. To satisfy this inordinate appetite, they seize many of our black free subjects. They sell them. After having taken these prisoners to the coast secretly or at night, as soon as the captives are in the hands of the white men, they are branded with a red hot iron. Movember succeeded somewhat in limiting the power of the slave traders. In 1526, a commission was established to determine the legality of all enslaved persons presented for sale. At the very least, this allowed the slavers only to trade prisoners of war from neighbouring kingdoms. Movember's adoption of Catholicism played a key role in the diplomatic relations with the Portuguese, and potentially made it easier for him to reach an agreeable, albeit unequal, compromise with the slavers. But unlike Congo's depiction in Civ VI, his devotion to the European faith did not imply the kingdom-wide conversion to Christianity, 
and many Congolese kept their ancient religious beliefs, sometimes incorporating aspects of Catholicism into them. This area of Central Africa is in fact home to thousands of different religions, faiths and pantheons, many of which still survive to this day. One of the most prominently held beliefs across the region is that the universe is split between two worlds, a world of the living and a world of the dead, which are split by a body of water. Those who could communicate with the spirits of the world of the dead were often given both religious and secular authority. The spirits in question were believed to inhabit figurines like this. These are known as Nikizi. In Civilization VI, any relic, artifact and sculpture that the Congolese own represents Nikizi, grunting Congo plus two food, plus two production, plus one faith and plus four gold. It is admirable that Phyrexis nods its head to this ancient belief, as it is one of those examples of African history that is underrepresented. However, it is difficult to find a real-life justification for the powerful food and production yields the Nikizi provide. I mean, even if we were to believe that spirits inhabited objects, it would still be a stretch to say that the spirit provided us food and productivity. But then again, vampires are now canon in this universe, so why can't the Congolese Michelangelo sculpture of David help your city build shit faster? Perhaps an alternative would be to drastically increase the faith bonus, because one thing that the Congolese Civ seriously lacks due to its inability to construct holy sites is faith production. But how does Congo's other benefits hold up to reality? Congo's unique district is the Imbanza, replacing the neighbourhood. It can be constructed earlier than normal neighbourhood districts all the way back in the medieval era. It's much cheaper to build and grants plus 5 housing regardless of appeal, plus 2 food and plus 4 gold. This is much more powerful than the district it replaces, as it encourages growth from a significantly earlier stage in the game, meaning that Congo's production can shoot up to a considerable degree far earlier than other sieves. And since you don't have to worry about the appeal of a tile, anywhere is a good place to build. Although obviously this wasn't intentional, there is one dynamic about the Mbanza district that summarised Congo's tragic post-independence history. It's typical that in a single-player higher difficulty game, the AI spies really like to choose neighbourhood districts for their operations, which results in wave after wave of partisans being recruited by them. That's poignantly reflective of the post-independence history of both the Republic of the Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Foreign agitators of regional and international powers and interest groups forcibly leading the population into bloody civil wars. There are many examples of children as young as six years old being forced to fight for violent militias. In conclusion, the history of the Congolese civilization is a double-edged sword. One side depicts tragedy, war, enslavement and injustice. But on the other hand, it is also a story of greatness, of rich cultural and religious activity, of exchange and vitality. It is not the case that at one point the Congo simply became Catholic, end of story. In fact, whilst the Congo imported aspects of Christianity to add to its own existing religious practice, it also exported its own practice to the Americas via the slave trade. Candombele in Brazil, Comfa in Guyana, and Palomonte in Cuba are just a few examples of diasporic folk religions that have their origins in the Congo Basin. Some of them have more elements from Christianity, some of them are more about Nikizi in the spirit world, but it would be unsatisfactory to a lot of people, Catholics included, to claim that these Congolese faiths were in essence Catholic. So perhaps an alternative to the current game mechanic disallowing the Congo to form a religion would be a system in which the Congo civilization can alter an existing religion with its own beliefs, building its own holy sites to also enable a strong faith game. And the idea of a sieve that can't form its own religion but gains considerable bonuses from adopting other sieves' religions is still a very good idea. But there are just many other sieves that could easily take this bonus without misrepresenting their own culture. Perhaps better examples would be the Catholic Spanish kings during the Reconquista of Iberia, or the Ottoman Empire, which can't create its own faith, but can overtake, adapt, and change an opposing civ's religion after conquest. For instance, the Ottoman Empire seized the title of the Caliphate in 1517. Those civs could earn bonuses from holy wars for a faith that they obviously never founded. You think that the addition of Queen Nzinga Mbande as the new leader for the Congo has solved this problem of religious representation? Let us know in the comments. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, don't forget to like and subscribe to History in Bits.